Let's pray together. Father, we pray, Lord, you open the pages of the scriptures to us. Open our hearts to the Bible. Open heaven to every one of us. And I pray that we'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Your blessing will enrich every life. Bless everyone. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage, that is to the wedding. And when they wanted wine, when the large wine, when the wine finished, the mother of Jesus says unto him, they have no wine. Jesus says unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And his mother says unto the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. Continue two or three fuckings of peace. Jesus says unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And he filled them to the brim. And he says unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he says unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth the good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. I believe in him. Tonight, we're looking at that passage I read to you just now. If you have followed through the reading, you will see there was a manifestation, the manifestation of Christ's glory, and it is through a miracle. This first miracle of Jesus that he performed at the beginning of his ministry on earth has a lot of lessons for us. First of all, you notice in that verse 11, this beginning of miracles. That means this is the first miracle he ever performed. There are some spurious writings you will find in some uh, false um, writings that Jesus had childhood miracles. That he did this, he did this, he did that before the age of 30. Now you have understood that all those things are false. That this is the very false miracle. But in this miracle that he did, if you look at the story as you follow from verse 1, you have a lot of lessons to learn. Number one, we see the place of the miracle. The place where he performed the miracle. That's very important. You see the first miracle of Moses, if you remember, it was turning water into blood. It was a miracle of judgment. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he performed the miracle was at a wedding, a feast of the wedding, and it was a miracle of blessing. Number two, the preparation. The preparation that the people had. There are many people that just think, I want a miracle, I want a miracle. Yes, Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. But as we look at the miracles of Jesus, number one, the place of the miracle. Number two, the preparation for the miracle. Number three, is power to work miracles. Is power to work miracles. Already we have learned that Jesus Christ is God. is the son of God. He is God. And because of that, he has omnipotence. He has power. Number four is the performance. You will see the performance. There was no theater. There was no drama. There was nothing. He just said, 
fill the water pots of the brim, and he did. Draw it out now, and he did. Take it to the master of ceremony, and he did. And a miracle had been performed already. Number five is the pattern. The pattern of performing his miracles. This first one shows us a good pattern. You will see that there was uh, no sweating. There was, uh, you know, nothing hysterical. There was nothing that jolted anyone. It was just a peaceful thing because this is the Prince of Peace performing miracle. Number six, you see the purpose of the miracle. He manifested forth his glory. And that's always the reason why he performs miracle, manifesting his glory. And then you'll see number seven, the persuasiveness. The persuasiveness of the miracle because it says as they saw the miracles his disciples that believed before now they really really believed on him the persuasiveness of the miracle not only that as we as i've read the story to you concerning this miracle that he performed you'll observe and you will learn number one there was no pride there was no pride. There are many people today that say they are following Jesus Christ. They're going to perform a miracle, come and see, uh, you know, a wonder that I'm going to do, and they pump up themselves. Number one, there was no pride. Number two, there was no pretense. There's no pretense there. You can see everything very clearly. No hypocrisy at all. Number three, there was no prancing. Prancing. Prancing is a word we use for a kind of a dramatic movement of the body. That, you know, they, they go here, they go there, they run there, they do a lot of things. And there was no dramatic thing like that at all. No peculiar bodily movements. Number four, there's no prolonged prayers. Prolonged prayers. You know, they're looking to heaven, they're looking in the, on the ground, they're looking this side, they're pointing that way, and they're praying and praying and praying before something happened. This was miracle there's no prolonged prayer number five there was no parade or pageantry no parade or pageantry i could you see the simplicity of the miracle and the way the miracle came forth the way it's going to come out in your life yeah. number six there was no perspiration perspiration you see there are people when they say that today is miracle time they tighten their belt, they put their whatever on, or it is on, and then they are ready. They say today is today, and they are ready to fight today. And before anything happens at all, everybody is tired and worn out and weary and perspiring. And here you find nothing like that at all. There's no perspiring. And then number seven, there's no pushiness. Pushiness. When somebody is pushy, when they're obstetricians, it's like everything is for a show. Everything is for a dramatization. There's no pushiness here. Our Lord Jesus Christ is mighty and powerful. And he's still the same today as he ever was. You know what the Bible says? Let me show you. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. It says, uh, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ, what he did before, is able to do today in your life. Because it's the same yesterday and today and forever. So today, as we look at this story, we're going to look at the details of the story. You understand? Because if you don't understand, if you just, you know, run over everything and then let us pray, you don't really get the thing the Lord wants to teach us. That's why we're going to go step after step. And by the time we finish, you will know how to get a miracle yourself. And you will know how to plug in and how to switch it on. There will be power manifestation of life in Jesus' name. We have titled it the manifestation of Christ's glory. The manifestation of Christ's glory through miracles. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the proper perception of Christ's first miracle. This is first miracle. And we need a proper perception. The proper perception of Christ's first miracle. Number two, the perceived principles in Christ's frontal miracle. It's a miracle in front of the other miracles. All the other miracles will come later, but this one is in front. That's why we call it a frontal miracle. The perceived principles in Christ's frontal miracle 
miracle. And then number three, the pertinent purpose, important purpose, unforgettable purpose, the pertinent purpose of Christ's foremost miracle. Foremost miracle. This one comes as number one. And we sometimes say first and foremost. That means at the beginning, let's settle this. And that's what Christ is doing here. He's giving us the pertinent purpose of Christ's foremost miracle. Number one. What's number one? Proper perception of Christ's first miracle. Because, you know, if you don't have a perception of Christ's first miracle, you're going to form some wrong ideas. And those wrong ideas will not help you, will not help your Christian life, and will not help your Christian understanding. Let's look at it now, verses 1 to 4. Verses 1 to 4, I'm looking at verse 1, and the third day, what does that mean? He just met Nathaniel in chapter 1 at the end of chapter 1. And Nathaniel confessed, you are the king of the Jews and the king of Israel and you are the very son of God. Three days after that, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And do you remember that Cana of Galilee actually, that was the hometown of Nathaniel that he just met. Look at this. I'm looking at... Um, John chapter 21, verse 2. John chapter 21, verse 2. It says, They were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of who? Of where? Of Cana in Galilee. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. He just met Nathaniel and he revealed himself to him and he said, you will see greater things than this. After giving him that promise, you'll see greater things. Now it says, the third day after, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. The mother of Jesus was invited. Look at verse 2. And uh, both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So the people having the wedding, the bridegroom and the bride, the husband to be and the wife to be, they invited Jesus and they invited his disciples. That is the disciples he got in chapter one. And when they wanted wine, that means when the wine finished, it says, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. And remember, Jesus had not performed the miracle up until this time. And yet, you're surprised that the mother came to him and said, they don't have any wine. Why would she tell him that? She told him that because she knows the age, she knew the age of Jesus. Now Jesus was about 30 years of it. And she knew the scriptures that when God has called you and given you a ministry, that those priests in the Old Testament, at the age of 30, they normally started their ministry. And now looking at Jesus Christ, you have age now. And this is your time. This is the time to show that the Lord called you. You know why? She knew that because the Bible says she pondered all these things in her heart concerning Jesus Christ. When those people came, the shepherds came, they talked about Jesus. And when all the people in the synagogue, in the temple came, they spoke about Jesus. And then at the age of 12, don't you know I must be by my father's business? And wasn't talking of Joseph. You don't find Joseph here at all. He's talking about the heavenly father. And Mary had been pondering those things in her heart. And so she said, this is your chance. I know that God has called you for this. I know you have come to meet me. And I know you are the age of 30. I know your ministry is starting now. And so he said, they don't have any wine. You can do something. And then Jesus says unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? What's the meaning of that? He's saying, I'm not like 12 years of age now to follow you and to be submissive to you as a mother. This is a divine call. And this is a divine ministry. And this is what the Lord has sent me to do. This one is not a family deal. This one is not a family discussion. This, not, this one is not something you and I will sit at the table and then consider, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. You see, those uh, verses are read to you. 
Many people have read those verses and they have, uh, they have some problems on those verses. What are the problems? Number one, the problem of wedding. Number two, the problem of wine. Number three, the problem of calling the mother woman. Many people have read this, they don't understand, and they say, number one, the wine. What kind of wine? Number two, the wedding. How did they do their weddings at that time? And number three, calling the mother woman. And so we're going to look at that in this section one now. I divide that to three parts. Number one, the presence of Christ at the wedding. The presence of Christ at the wedding. Number two, the perversion of Christ's creation of wine. He turned water into wine. Ah, some people say, there you are. All the wine we want to drink, all the wine we can take, and what they mean in their own cases, alcohol. There's no alcohol here. There's no drunkenness here. There's no intoxication here. There is no violence here. There's no vomiting here. There's no falling in the gutter here. But they don't understand. <clears throat> and so they want to pervert the creation of the wine. And then the propriety of calling his mother woman. The propriety of calling the mother woman. Let's look at that one by one. Number one is the presence of Christ at the wedding. I'm looking at verses one and two. And the third day, there was a marriage, that's a wedding, in Cana of Galilee. And the mother, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now you are wondering, how is it that the first public occasion that Jesus Christ attended was a wedding, was a marriage? You need to understand that he looked at his own kingdom and he looked at the marriage and he saw the similarities. He wanted to teach his own disciples the similarities between the kingdom and the marriage. You look at uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, he gave this uh, parable, he gave this illustration concerning the kingdom. And it is concerning uh, the marriage. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22 from verse 1, and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And because of his own uh, you know, kingdom that he wanted to teach his own disciples, and he talked about the kingdom. Everywhere he went, he talked about the kingdom and about the kingdom. From the very beginning to the end, there's a preparation for the kingdom. And it is the father, the king, that is making the kingdom for the son. And it's the heavenly father that is going to give the, his kingdom unto his own very son. And is going to invite people and the Holy Ghost is going to go out. It's going to select people from here, from there, from there. And bring them into the kingdom. And there is an arrangement, a kind of dress they will wear, which is white, in that, uh, in that marriage and in that kingdom. And also, there are qualifications to meet. There are behaviors and there are place it ways you set yourself and prepare yourself for the wedding and that's what because of that that's why he came to attend this wedding and then even in this parable you come to look at verse 30 now in verse 30 that is chapter 22 verse 13. Here he tells us about something which is still about the future. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angel of God in heaven. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, I am reading from verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed on the field. You see, he wanted to sanction the marriage, approve the marriage, recognize the marriage. He wanted to tell his own disciples, Peter, you know, marriage is not wrong. 
He wanted to tell John, John, you know, marriage is not wrong. And Philip and Nathaniel, marriage is not wrong. You see, there are religious people that feel that if you're going to be religious, very religious, and you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to be a minister, no marriage. Jesus said, no, no. In fact, I'm going to demonstrate that to you. The very first miracle I'm going to perform will be at a marriage wedding. That means then, uh, when you are getting married, I pray Jesus. Jesus will be there. Yeah. His presence will honor your marriage. Yeah. His power will honor your marriage. But you understand, you understand, if they had been doing some uh, bad things, idolatrous things, to call these things, to bring the marriage together, Christ would not have been there. If that marriage had been dedicated to Satan and dedicated to the paths of darkness, Christ would not have been there. It's telling us that if you want the Lord to be at your marriage and to be in your family, that you must make sure that paths of darkness are not there at all. They're not involved at all. Thank God for you, children of God. Satan will not be at your wedding. Yeah. Demons will not be at your wedding. Yeah. Jesus will be there. Yeah. And the power, the presence of the Lord will be there in Jesus' name. He wanted to tell them at the beginning so that they would know what to expect at the end. Understand that? He wanted to show them what to do at the beginning that they will know what to expect at the end. We're looking at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 and I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. That's talking about Jesus himself at the end of time. At the end of time, the church is bride, will be joined unto him. And he wanted to tell them, you see, it's like uh, the curriculum. It's like the syllabus. It's like disciples, you know what we're getting to? We're getting to the final destination. And we're starting with the marriage because at the end, every time you're ministry, you understand, you're raised not a bride for Christ, a pure bride, a righteous bride, a gracious bride. You're looking at that end, and it showed them from the beginning as well, we're going to this wedding, because the time will come when Christ himself and his bride will be ready, and it says, let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Thank God I'll be there. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And she says unto me, These are the true saints of God. God. I come back to John chapter 2. You see, the next problem people have with this passage we're looking at today is uh, it's worth wine. It's worth wine. They say, you people say we shouldn't drink alcohol. You people say that alcohol is not uh, good for us. And then you say the Bible says you must not do this, you must not do But look at Jesus Christ now and look at what he did. We're coming to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 3. John chapter 2 verse 3 and when they wanted wine, when they lacked wine and they wanted more, the mother of Jesus saith unto him they have no wine. Come to verse 9. In verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the fields called the bridegroom and says unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine, the good wine, God has got something for you. Now, when you read the Bible, you, you need to understand this is Cana of Galilee. This is not a Cana of Nigeria. This is not Cana of Ghana. It is not Cana of uh, Mozambique. It is Cana of Galilee. It was in the land of Israel. And you see the land of Israel, they had their understanding about wine. It is not the people that have made the wine, you, you know, you can refer to today. They, have not, they didn't exist at that time. 
time and the process by which they made the wine today had not existed at that time now when they say wine in the bible you need to understand there is wine there's strong drink there is wine which will call the fruit of the vine that is you have the fruit inside the vine and then you press them and you bring the liquid the juice out we call it juice but they call it wine look at isaiah chapter 65 isaiah chapter 65 i'm reading from verse 8 isaiah chapter 65 verse 8 notice here it says thus says the lord as the new wine is found in the cluster hold on there it is still in the cluster it has not been fermented and it is called the new wine in the cluster it's still in the cluster it has not even been brought out as the juice it's just like we say as the wine is in the grave as the wine is inside the orange as the wine is inside you know whatever fruit and juice you want to make is still there and there's no drunkenness there it's just the fruit look at that verse 8 it says thus says the lord as the new wine is found in the cluster and one says destroy it not for there is a blessing in it that is it will give us some nutrients in our body it will give us some development in our body it will feed us it will nourish us it will help us there is a blessing in it therefore don't destroy it so will i do to for my servant's sake that i may not uh, destroy them all the lord will not destroy you and his blessings will not destroy you and do you know sometimes when we say we take the holy communion the lord's supper there's the bread and they tell me and the wine now what's the wine what's the wine we're looking at matthew chapter 26 matthew chapter 26 and we're reading from verse 29 matthew chapter 26 verse 29 but i say unto you i will not drink henceforth of this tell me fruit of the vine is wine but it's called the fruit of the vine that means you make the juice and then you put it in a glass in a cup in a container and there's no fermentation there's no alcohol there's no intoxication it doesn't make you mad it doesn't take over your brain it doesn't take over your life it's just the fruit juice and it says listen to this i will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine tell me the rest there until I drink it new with you where in my father's kingdom are you going to drink alcohol in the father's kingdom uh, drunkards going to have bottles of intoxicating wine over there in the kingdom no it's talking about what he did here is in preparation for what he's going to do over there what is going to give us over there it says i will drink it new with you in my father's kingdom we're not talking about alcohol here this is the fruit of the vine and it is good and when jesus makes it i say it is good when jesus gives to you i say it is good He'll give you good things in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 25. Mark chapter 14, verse 25, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more. Look at that. You say, we read that before. Yes, I, I understand. But you know what it means here? It says, I've been drinking, I've been drinking, I've been drinking. Now I'm going to take some time off because I want to face the cross. Then I will die at the cross. And during this time of going to the cross, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine. But then I will rise again. Our Lord has risen. And then he will go to heaven and he'll be waiting for us and then rapture will take place and when we get over there that no more will be taken away and then we're going to start again isn't that wonderful look at that verse now and see if you understand very well chapter 14 verse 25 verily i say unto you i will drink no more of the fruit of the vine of the fruit of the vine that's what he made that's what he made but they call it wine in those days and then he says until the day that i drink it new in the kingdom of 
God in the kingdom of God. Now, there are people that twist the scripture. There are people that will rest the scripture. There are people that will distort the scriptures. They are drunkards. They don't want to repent. They like alcohol. They don't want to repent. They're taking nothing that will burn up their brain and begin to make them say some nasty things, and they don't want to repent. And therefore, they will go to John chapter 2. They will say, you know, after all, you people, you need to understand that Jesus made water wine. And therefore, that's what they're drinking. You're not drinking the kind of wine he made. You're not drinking the fruit of, Jew, the, the fruit of the vine. You're drinking something that will destroy your life. Look at uh, Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 16. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 16. It says, as also in all these epistles, speaking in, the, speaking in them of these things, in which are some, are some things hard to be understood, which look at this, they that are unlearned and unstable, rest, distort, twist, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. They twist the scriptures unto their own destruction. What does the Bible say about the wine? Look at this. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Look at the next verse. And be not, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. It says, Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous. Tell me what follows. Nor drunkards. No revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so you see the problem of wine that is settled. The one Jesus made, the wine he made, we call it by another name, the fruit of the vine. What name do we call that wine? Tell me out loud. The fruit of the vine, that one doesn't make anybody intoxicated. Have you taken either orange juice or banana juice or pineapple juice or whatever before? Were you drunk? No, that one doesn't make people drunk. And the people, the juice, they call that wine. They call that wine, but it's the fruit of the vine. We're coming back to um, John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and I'm reading now from verse uh, 4. It says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. You see, there are many people who have stumbled at that. Is that proper? What's the propriety of Jesus calling his mother woman? Because, you see, our language today is different. If uh, your mother was talking to you and you said, woman, your mother will count that disrespectful. But to see at that time, it was, the norm, it was a language of respect. And it wasn't just at this time that Jesus shows that. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 15. You understand? It was uh, with utmost with great respect. With great respect. We don't use that language today because people will misunderstand. But at that time, it was a language of respect. We're looking at Matthew chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 20. Eight. Matthew chapter 15. I'm waiting for you to open your Bible. Matthew chapter, what's the chapter? What's the verse? 28. Look at this. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. You see that? It was a sign of respect. There was no disrespect at all. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that hour. We're looking at Luke 
Luke chapter 13. How could Jesus call his mother woman? Is that disrespectful? Well, that wasn't the only time. You'll find that Jesus, whenever he respected a mother, a woman, a wife, anybody, I will say woman. We're looking at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 12. Luke chapter 13, verse 12. It says, let me back up to verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Look at this. I'm back together. And could you know why she lift up herself? And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Tell me, there is no disrespect there. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. He wanted to be a blessing to the woman. He wanted to deliver the woman, release her from that bondage of the devil, and then respectfully call her woman. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. I'm coming to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 21. John chapter 4 verse 21. Are you there? John chapter 4 verse 21 and Jesus said unto her, what? Woman, believe me. You know, he had read, she, he commended that woman. He said, you have told the truth. And he was going to forgive her her sin. He was going to give her the water of life. He was going to give her eternal life. But call her woman. There's no disrespect there. You know, there are some people, whenever they read the Bible, eh, they want to, their own heart that wants to disrespect other people. They want to disrespect their mother, or maybe their wife, or maybe their sister, or maybe any of our leaders who are women in the church. And then they think, you know, they think they are doing like Jesus, and in a very arrogant way, they said, woman, no, that wasn't the idea of Jesus at all. It was a word of respect. And I pray that uh, the, the love and the respect God had in Christ, he'll have in you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 21. Yeah, Jesus says unto a woman, believe me, the hour cometh when when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And then he goes on. We're looking at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 10. John chapter 8 verse 10. You remember the story. And here, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none of the and, and saw none but the woman says unto her, was it? Woman, you see, it's not it's not something peculiar that just at that time he called the mother woman. That, that's what he called the women because he respected the women so much as mothers, as wives, and as uh, sisters, whoever they were. He said, Woman, where are those that accuse us? As no man condemned thee, Jesus, and is she safe unto her? She says, No man, Lord, and Jesus says, Tell me. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. I came to save. And I came to show the love of God unto everybody, unto men, unto women. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Point number two. We're coming to the perceived principles in Christ's frontal miracle. Christ's frontal miracle. The perceived principles. I'm reading from verse 5. In verse 5. His mother says unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. That's how to get miracle. And you're going to get it. Whatsoever, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Look at verse 6. And there was set there six water pots of stone. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews, continued two or three fucking appears. Jesus says unto them, Fill the water pots with water. Fill them with water. We're not looking for water. We're looking for wine. No argument whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And he filled them to the brim. And he says unto them, draw out now. Are you not going to pray? Are you not going to command? Are you not going to touch the water pause? Whatsoever he says unto you, 
do it. You see, we're not the people to dictate to the Lord. And we're not the one to tell him, I will do a creative miracle. Whether it touches you or not, whether the pastor, the minister touches you or not, a miracle is coming your way. It says, I draw out now and bear unto the governor of the fields, and they bear it. And then it goes on about when they bought the water, and then he gave it to the master of ceremony. He said, this is good. Something is happening in your life. Yeah. And people who know you and see it will say, this is good. As I look at this, the beginning of miracles done by Jesus Christ, there are important instructions for all who seek and expect a spiritual miracle, a physical miracle, a creative miracle, because all that we're learning here is how God will do a creative miracle in your life to make you a new creation and to make you a new creature. There's a conversion here. Can't you see the conversion converting water into what? Into wine. There's transformation here. Don't, see, don't you see transformation? It was water, but then it became wine. This is how he performs miracles of transformation and the miracle of healing and the miracle of deliverance and the miracle of dominion or it's a miracle of sanctification or a miracle of a pure heart or the miracle of a provision that was lack. They have no wine and then the provision came. This is how he does it and a miracle of empowerment. Power will come into your life. The spirit baptism, abundant sufficiency, all things are possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no impossibility with him. I said there's no impossibility with him. That problem will vanish away. The Lord will touch your life in Jesus' name. What do you see here that I've read to in this John chapter 2 from verse 5? Number 1, the condition for his miracles. The condition for his miracles. Look at that. Verse 5. His mother says unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. That's the condition for his miracle. You know, anybody that doesn't understand who Jesus is, how mighty Jesus is, how powerful Jesus is, and that Jesus has creative power, he could have said, we're not looking for water. We're looking for wine. We're not looking for this. That's what we're looking for. And if you're going to, if you tell us to bring in the fruit, the vine, and then you quickly say some people should press it, and then some people should make the juice, then we understand. But you say, fill the water pause with water. That's not what we're looking for. You see, that's the condition for his miracle. Look at chapters, chapter 5 of Luke. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Here is the principle. How God will will work miracle in your life. Yeah. Okay, in my life. Yeah. I said in my life. Yeah. Look at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 4. When now, when he had let speaking, he says unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. That's the condition. That's the condition. Let down your nest for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, 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 at thy word, I will let down the net. That's the condition, the condition of the miracle. And it says, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their nets break. Number two. We're coming to John chapter two. John chapter two. I read from verse six. And when, and there was set there six water pots of stone. After the manner of purifying of the Jews, uh, they, they had that in every house, in every Jewish house. Because you see, when they come in, uh, they need water to wash their feet. They, they were using sandals, and the streets were dusty. Therefore, they had those water pots ready there. And at this wedding, all the many people that were there, they needed the water pots now. The water was not there. The wine was not there. That's why Jesus now said, fill the water pots uh, with 
is a water. And then it says in verse 7, and Jesus said, fill the water pause with water. Number two, that's a command from the master. Command from the master. The first one, the condition for his miracle. Number two, the command from the master. You see, when you command source like that, you see, are you not going to pray? I don't know to talk to the Father. I'm not going to lay hands on us. I'm not going to push us and shake us. The command from the master. This is how your miracle will come today. Amen. Look at uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 5. Command from the master. In Luke chapter 17, we're reading it from verse 12. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and he lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They wanted cleansing from their leprosy, like you want healing for your sickness. It will happen. But look at this, verse 14. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priest. That's a command from the master. Go show yourself to the priest. Are you not going to pray? Are you not going to anoint us with oil? Are you not going to do this or do that? Are you not going to push us? So we're slain in the spirit. Go show yourself to the priest. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. Verse 14, tell me. As they, what happened? They were cleansed. That's it. That's it. Feel the water pots to the brim. The water pots. The water pots that were there that were empty. The sermons were commanded. And you see, there is the pattern of the Lord. The pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. How he performs miracles. How he works miracles. That it, it's not that you are waiting. He will shake me. I will jump up. He will lift me up. He will embrace me. He gives a command. Number one is the condition for his miracles. Number two, the command from the master. Number three, cooperation with our maker. Cooperation with our maker. You see here, Christ did not give any explanation of the command. It's a command without explanation. And there was obedience with expectation. Command without explanation and then obedience with expectation. And what he did, he did what he told them to do. I will do what he tells me to do. And when you do it, a miracle will follow. In your heart, he'll perform a miracle. In your life, a miracle. In your family, a miracle. Look at this. I'm reading from chapter 2. Chapter 2. I'm reading the second part of verse 7. Chapter 2, second part of verse 7. And he filled them to the brim. And he filled them to the brim. That is, until the water was even overflowing, they filled the water pause to the brim. You can tell, these people were full of faith and expectation. And remember, remember, Jesus had not performed any miracle before this time. But they recognized him, that's the Son of God. They recognized him, that's the Messiah. They recognized him, that's the Christ. And whatever he tells us to do, we're going to do happily, joyfully, cheerfully, and they did it with excitement and they feel the water pours to the brim. You see what he tells you to do, do it joyfully. A miracle will follow. Do it happily. A miracle will follow. And do it excitedly. A miracle will follow. I'm looking at John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and I'm reading from verse 1. John chapter 9 verse 1. He gave them a commandment. They cooperated with him as our maker, as the one that can perform the miracle in their lives. John chapter, tell me, verse what? And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. That will be manifest in you today. 
And then in verse 4, I must walk the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and he made clay of the spittle, and he say, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and said unto him, Tell me, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Master, I cannot see. That's why I need your help. I was born blind. You make clay now, and you put it, and you put on my eyes, and you tell me to go, and you're not even giving me somebody that will guide me and lead me there. Cooperation with our maker. Whatsoever he says unto you, do. That's how they got me at that time. That's how you are going to get me at this time. And then he said, and he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. You will see. Number four, number one is condition, the condition of his miracles. Number two is the command from the master. Number three, cooperation with our maker. Number four, confidence in the Messiah. Confidence in the Messiah. We're coming to Lou, to John chapter two. John chapter two. I'm reading here from verse, I'm reading from verse eight. We're reading from verse eight in John. John chapter 2, verse 8. And he says unto them, draw out now. No prayer. No speaking in tongues. No touching of the water pots. And there was no sweating. There's no gyration. There's no pricing. There's nothing at all. Just fill the water pots. They did. Okay. As soon as they did, he said, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear each. Number four, confidence in the Messiah. Confidence in the Messiah. The Lord will not disappoint your expectation. Uh, you, you can see how simple the miracles of Jesus Christ are. It is not uh, something difficult at all. Do this and you do. Do this and you do. Go there and you go. Bear it out now and you bear it. Go back home. Your son is healed. You say, praise the Lord. My son is healed. Go back home. The job is there. Praise the Lord. I've got my job. Go back home. That disease is cured. And then you say, amen. I thought you'd say amen. Yeah. And then everything is all right. In my life, everything is all right. It's so, it's so simple to serve Jesus. It's so simple to get the blessing of Jesus. There's no sweating at all. And I see miracle around you right there today. We're looking, we're looking at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 13. John chapter 11 verse 13. And, and Jesus says, take you away the stone. Here is the Messiah talking. Here is Christ. Here is the one that he says, I'm life and resurrection. Take ye away the stone, and Martha, the sister of him that was dead, says unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus says unto her, Said not I unto thee, that if thou shouldest believe, wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Somebody there tonight is believing. You will see the glory of God. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. He has not even prayed. He has not even given the word. He said, Father, I know. Before I even talk, calling the things would be not as though they were. I know you have heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a lambkin. And Jesus says unto them, Lose him and let him go. Your bondages are broken. Yeah. The things that tie you up, they're taking away in Jesus' name. 
Number one, condition for his miracles. Number two, the command from the master. Number three, cooperation with a maker. Number four, confidence in the Messiah. Number five, confirmation of the miracle. Confirmation in your life. Confirmation in the miracle. Look at look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 9 and verse 10. When the ruler of the fields had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew uh, the water knew. The governor of the fields called the bridegroom, and he says unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept this good wine until now. Until now. Today, until now. I said today, until now. You know, some people said, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, but the Lord has kept something good waiting for you. Yeah. And it is until this very time, cheer up. Yeah. Those tears are dried. Yeah. Cheer up. All those problems are taken away. Yeah. Because the Lord has kept this good thing until now. Before I go on, hold on now. When Moses came, they thought, Israel thought they had got the very best. And then came Joshua. They said, this is wonderful. And then comes David. And he killed Goliath. And he said, Israel is a favored nation. And then Isaac came, Jeremiah came, Malachi came. Everything was over. And then they thought, the good old days... When are we going to have the good old days? And then Jesus came because the Father has kept this good thing for the nation until this time. You see, there are many people who have been in religion and they will say, we got this, we got this, we got that. And now righteousness comes, redemption comes, and God has kept something better waiting for you in Jesus' name. And so there was a confirmation, confirmation, confirmation in your life. Yeah. Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them. And tell me the word there. Confirming the word with signs following, and the people of God said, yeah. Amen. We'll come to point number three now. The pertinent purpose of Christ's foremost miracle. What's the purpose of this miracle? And when God works a miracle in your life, what's the purpose? We're coming to John chapter 2 verse 11. John chapter 2 verse 11. This beginning of miracles. Did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. His disciples believed on him. There are two words I want you to understand here. Number one is the word glory. Glory. He manifested forth, he shone forth his glory. And then number two, his disciples believed on him. He has glory. And that glory he will reveal in your life. Because we're told in John chapter 1, John chapter 1 verse 14, in verse 14 it says, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, like you behold his glory tonight. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Come to chapter 17 verse 24. Chapter 17, we're looking at verse 24. It says in verse 24, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that where I am, that they may behold, what? My glory, when thou hast given me, for thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. That glory will be revealed unto you. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 18, glory. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. In verse 18, but we all, how many of us? 
men and women, but we all. How many of us? young and old but we all and how many of us are going to see the glory tonight you will never be the same again but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the lord were changed like he changed the water into wine like he transformed the water into wine were changed and transformed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the lord in chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It will bring you to glory. Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, the purpose why he has called you, why he saved you, why you are converted, and the purpose why you are here today, and you'll keep on coming to the study, is to bring you to glory. Look at this, in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for who? and for you and for me for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in tell me tell me out loud you will not come to shame you will not come to disgrace Eternal hell, eternal fire, you'll not be there. Amen. His purpose of bringing us, his purpose of working miracles in our lives, the miracle of conversion, the miracle of transformation, and the miracle of sanctification and holiness, and the miracle of healing, deliverance, and everything, is to bring us to glory. It says in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them uh, brethren we're coming to john chapter 2 john chapter 2 i read from verse 11 this beginning of miracles the jesus in king of galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And his disciples did what? Believed on him. And I believe on him. I said, I believe on him. And as you believe, his glory will shine forth in your life. And as you look at John, that is this God of St. John, what they had done, what those disciples did, and they believed, he comes in almost every chapter, and he's saying, I have believed, have you believed? I have believed, have you believed? I have believed, have you believed? Look at John, I'm reading from chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. That's what you have today. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 24, I believe, you believe, we believe, we'll see the glory of God. John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth, believeth on him that sent me as everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Chapter 6, verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. We're looking at chapter 8, verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye shall be my disciples indeed. I will continue. 
and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Chapter 12, we're looking at verse 46. Chapter 12, verse 46, to believe, and then the consequence in our lives. It says in chapter 12, verse 46, I'm come, I am come in light into the world, that whosoever believers on me shall not abide in darkness. You will not abide in darkness. Amen. Chapter 20, verse 31. Chapter 20, we're reading from verse 31. John, chapter 20, verse 31. But these are reaching that you might believe. All that we have learned today, they are reaching that you might believe and that be, and ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have, and that believing ye might have life through him. Lord, I believe. I have everlasting life. Lord, I believe. I have eternal life. Lord, I believe. You are bringing me to glory. Rise up and tell the Lord you believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. You see what the Lord has done? You see, I performed this first miracle. You see the simplicity of his miracle. You see the supernatural nature of his miracle. See the place where I performed the miracle? The preparation they made in obedience to the Lord. His power remains the same today. And the pattern is ever the same. He gives a command. You obey, you cooperate. There's a confirmation. Your wedding wants to be there. Your marriage wants to be there. Your family it wants to be there. Your fellowship it wants to be there. And his presence makes a difference in your life. The presence of Christ, the presence of the Savior, the presence of your Lord, what a difference it makes. And you're not going to pervert his miracle, his miracle of creation. You're not going to pervert that. You're not going to make an excuse, the excuse of a drunkard, the excuse of a sinner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the true believer said, the conquerors tonight said, Amen. and those who are going to see the glory of God in their lives said, Amen. Father, we thank you tonight. What a study we are tonight. We thank you, Lord, because as we prayed at the beginning, you opened our eyes and we've seen wondrous things out of your word. Lord, I pray everything we've seen today will be beneficial to every learner and every disciple, every believer here in Jesus' name. In a very simple way, you did a supernatural sin. In that simple way tonight, I pray, there'll be a communication of the supernatural in every life, in every heart tonight, in Jesus' name. Change ordinary lives to become extraordinary. Change the weak lives to become very strong. And Lord, I pray there be a creative miracle in every life and every family tonight in Jesus' name. 
the great things we're expecting and we're saying, Lord, they don't have wine, Lord, they don't have strength, Lord, they don't have healing, Lord, they don't have health, Lord, they don't have jobs, Lord, they don't have wife, Lord, they don't have children. Lord, I pray in a very simple supernatural way, give us everything we're asking in Jesus' name. Victory in every life. Transformation in every life. Glory in every life. Lord, as we go back home, we discover the miracle. As we are discussing with our friends, we discover the miracle. As we told the people, bear the water now and bear each to the uh, head of uh, the feast. And I say, we're going. I say, we're going. That miracle happened. Oh, Lord, I pray. Miracle will follow everyone in Jesus' name. And Lord, you put testimony in every mouth. This supernatural in every life. In a very simple way tonight, I pray that those great things we have been looking for spiritually, those wonderful things we have been looking for physically, those things we have been looking for materially, and those things we are looking for in domestic areas, Lord, I pray professionally to you, you do it for everyone in Jesus' name. Let heaven open up on everyone. Let your people receive. Let the goodness and the glory of the Lord follow everyone home even tonight in Jesus' name. As the head of the feast confirmed it and said, This good thing has been kept until this time, there will be a confirmation in every life. Confirmation of joy. Confirmation of answered prayer. Confirmation of conversion. Confirmation of provision. Confirmation of a pure heart. Confirmation of signs and wonders. Confirmation in every family. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. I will say the glory of God.